Welcome everyone to Everlasting Faith Fellowship and welcome to our first live broadcast streaming on YouTube. We hope that everyone watching will be blessed by today's message. I'm Pastor James and today we're going to talk about responding to God's call from our new series, How Do We Have Faith? How Do We Have Faith? And I'm going to start off today with a, a short story about a, a 15-year-old girl named Lois. And she promised God that she would go overseas and perhaps to Africa or India and become a missionary to help those that were in need. <clears throat> but Lois never made that trip of mercy because at 23 she married a man who became a real heavy drinker. But many years later, her husband actually did become saved and he was a Christian and he testified to all of his old drinking buddies. But by then he was over 80 years old and he was nearing death. He wasn't doing very well. And when he passed away, Lois's childhood desire to become a missionary started coming back in her mind. And at first she resisted. She says, I'm 76 years old and I think I'm too old to do that. She said, Lord, I'm too old to go now. I, I can't do this. <clears throat> but this great grandmother was determined to fulfill her unforgotten promise to serve. And she was motivated by the memory of ignoring God's calling as a teenager. And she said, you know, I'm not going to refuse the second chance that he's giving me to become a missionary. <clears throat> so in her later years, Lois did become <clears throat> the unlikely builder of an orphanage in the Philippines. It was a lifeline really to 35 children whose lives had been rescued from neglect and from begging in the streets and sometimes parental abuse. And as a result, 35 orphans living in a two-story it was a small building, 2,000 square feet, and that's not too big for 35 people. And they called Lois Lola, which means grandmother in their native language. And Lois's children, as she called them, <clears throat> ranged in age from 8 months to about 10 years old. Each of their stories is heartbreaking, and Lois had built the orphanage without taking out a loan, relied instead on individual financial support from across the United States from various organizations and people. And she wasn't supported by any denomination. She depended solely on her own private donations, people that supported her. And when asked if that makes her nervous, she said, with confidence, she said, I serve a mighty God and I don't worry because he is in control. She said, I feel I'm not talented enough to do any of this, but God has enabled me, and my responsibility is to do then what God has enabled me to do. So here's a person who has <clears throat> heard the call of God, the God that was on her life, and she, she did something. She acted on it. Maybe not right away, but she eventually acted on it. Now, another person who heard that call many years ago was Abraham, formerly known as Abram. And he's a perfect example of someone who learned to rely on God by faith. And everyone who sets out on a faith venture would probably be a good idea for them to follow in Abraham's footsteps. Over the next few weeks, we'll be looking at the life of Abram, Abraham, I should say, and, and learning from his experience what it means to live by faith. So this week, I want to talk specifically about responding to God's call. Number one, God calls us to listen. He calls us to listen. Now, I know men out there have experienced, as I have, while watching TV, maybe sitting in your favorite chair, right? <clears throat> And your wife turns to you and says, do you have any idea what I just asked you for or spoke to you about? How often were you able to answer that and say exactly what she said? Most of the time, you're not able to do that because why? You weren't listening at all, were you? And sometimes it's like that with God, isn't it? There are times maybe you've been in worship, right? 
or reading the Bible, or even enjoying the creation that God has provided for us. And it's easy to hear from God then, isn't it, right? But then there are other times when it doesn't seem we're able to hear his voice at all. Now, while there could be any number of reasons for this, normally it's because we're either not listening for God or maybe we're not even expecting to hear from God. Let's go to the Bible now, book of Luke chapter 8, verse 18. The Bible says, pay attention to how you hear. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given, Jesus says. But for those who are not listening, even what they think they understand, it's going to be taken away from them. Now, I only know of one sure way to hear from, from God that's very practical and very simple. Get up each day and pray, right? Say, God, open my ears, my heart. Let me hear what you have to say today. And don't stop there. In everything you do throughout the day, you should say, is God in this? They had those, those pictures, WWJD. What would Jesus do in this situation? Now, we don't want to get weird about this, right, and start thinking the water cooler, right, is giving us a secret message because we want to hear from God no matter what it's from. But the idea is to simply live in expectation that God has something to say. And I believe that's how Abraham lived his life, ready to hear from God and ready to act upon what he heard. So what else should we respond to God's call? Well, he also calls us to separation. Separation. What is that? Well, he wants us to separate ourselves from the world when we respond to his call. When we step out in faith, God is not just asking us to accomplish something for him. He's asking that our lives be radically changed in different ways. And the changes I'm talking about are changes that involve some level of separation from our former way of life, our sinful life. And God called Abraham to leave everything that he knew for something completely unknown to him. <clears throat> Genesis 12 and 1. The Lord says to Abram, Abram, Abram at that time, leave your native country. Wow your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land I show you. Let's make this real, right? Suppose God came to you today and said, hey, uh, leave this town where you're living, leave your family here, leave your home that you've spent all this time and effort behind, quit your job that was so hard to get, and start heading in the direction I point you. Now, I'm not going to tell you where you're going just yet, all I want you to do now is leave. <laughs> How would you deal with that, right? How would you deal with that? Well, some of us, <laughs> that might just be the call we're waiting for, right? To get out of this place. But if you find yourself saying, wow, I couldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. Then you have to ask yourself if you're really willing to listen <clears throat> to God's call. Now, I'm not saying that God is calling each one of us to leave everything behind. No, but he very well might be, right? There's always a call of separation involved in your journey of faith. For instance, even if God isn't calling for us to leave our home and family behind, he's certainly calling us to separate from certain lifestyle choices. In my own life, I had a calling from God. It wasn't to leave my family, but it was to leave my job. I left my job and became involved in the ministry of church. Left my paying job. For actually at that time, it was a volunteer job. And some 20 some years later, here I am still doing what God called me to do. And he made a way for us. But it seemed like there was no way, as the songs say, he will make a way. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 1. 
verse 14 we're going to start with. It says, you must live as what? As God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then, the Bible says. Verse 15, but now you must what? Be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, what? You must be holy, God says, because I am holy. So what does that mean really in practical terms? And what does it mean for each one of us? Well, it means with God's help, can't do it on our own, with God's help, let's say we had a problem with adultery. Put that behind us. We had a problem with drinking or even drug, right? It's not going to be a problem anymore because God is there to get us through. Maybe we live a life without love. We're going to allow God to transform us into a person who loves others as Jesus loves us. <clears throat> Maybe we've been coming to church one day a week and not serving him the rest of the week. Well, God's going to help us to recommit ourselves to serving him. It means that we're going to dedicate ourselves to put on the holiness that God himself, right, has given to us and that he demonstrates himself. It's a matter of preparing us for the journey that he wants us to go on. And until I'm separated from anything that would hinder me, right, from doing what God wants, I'm not going to be ready for God's call. Now, Abram, right, he couldn't see the new life that God prepared for him until he separated himself from his old life. And for some, like Abram, that separation is from a physical place. But for all of us, it requires a separation from those things in the world that would keep us from fully experiencing the presence of God in our lives. I can't move forward in faith if I'm looking backward to my former way of life. I can't see where God wants to take me until I leave the place I presently am, right? I can't hear God's voice until I begin to listen. And I can't act upon his will until I'm willing to leave behind whatever is necessary to pursue the better future that he has planned for me because he never plans a bad future for you unlike some human people do now how else could we respond to god's call well he calls us something else to serve us he's calling us to serve and when we talk about a journey of faith we're talking about god calling us to do a specific thing or to perform a specific ministry. In other words, the journey of faith isn't just going to church, reading the Bible, and having a daily quiet time with Him. No, it's serving in whatever capacity He has called us to do. And how is that? It's doing it from the standpoint that we trust in God to give us the ability and the resources to see it through. So faith doesn't only say that we need to believe the right things. No, what God is calling us to is a life of doing those things, servanthood. We're actually acting on the faith that he has called us to do. Here's what he told Abram, Genesis 12, chapter, chapter 12, verse 2. He says, listen, I'm going to make you, Abram, into a great nation. Wow. <laughs> You're going to make one person into a great nation? He said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you famous. And you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. Now, that's a major thing, right? Too many people and preachers, too, tend to focus on the blessings that God promised. God said Abraham would be the father of a great nation. So he would be the one that would be blessing others 
through God's help. How was all this going to happen? Was God saying he was just going to wave his hand and say, uh, Alakazam and everything would just fall into place? No. How do we know that? Because if we read the whole story, right, in the Bible, you'd see that God would do all the things he promised, but he would do them in a special way that takes his time schedule, not what we're thinking about. It's important for us to understand God didn't call Abram because he was great. No. God called him, why? Because he was going to make him great. You can't be great on your own. God makes you great. So God chooses the ordinary person to be something great for the kingdom. The reason God could make him great was because Abram was willing to do something. He was willing to listen, amen? He was willing to separate himself from his former way of life and serve God. Let's go to Matthew chapter 20. It says, You observed how godless rulers throw their weight around, how quickly a little power goes to their heads. He said, It's not going to be like that with you. Whoever wants to be great must become a servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. So, Look at it another way. If you're not willing to participate in any kind of ministry, right? If you're not willing to maybe just clean up after a service at a church, that's a ministry. If you're not willing to pray, right, with a person maybe dying of terminal cancer, then you're not ready for a, a, any kind of journey with God. These are simply examples that I'm giving, but point is that God's call of faith is a call to serve. You have to be willing to serve Him. He doesn't just hand you things on a what they call silver platter. And remember that the call to service is not always a pretty one. It's not all roses and whipped cream and all that stuff. But it's a call that will grow, will multiply, and will receive the blessings of God Himself. God also calls us to security, security. Now God asked Abram to do all these things, right? But he also said he would take care of Abram. So let's go back to the book of Genesis, chapter 12, verse 3. He says, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. In other words, I'm going to watch your back. I got your back. Abram might have assumed that God's call meant his life would be easy, but it certainly wasn't. Security isn't tranquility and ease. It's really stability in the midst of life's storms. That's what real security from God is. And a long series of events in Abraham's life clearly demonstrates that God's protection doesn't shield us from things that happen in everyday life. When Abram reached the promised land, he discovered that it was populated by a large number of tribes who were plagued with some kind of famine. That's not a great place to be. Famine drove him to Egypt where because of his and Sarah's fear for their life, they agreed to be dishonest about their relationship. <clears throat> they told everyone that Sarah was his sister in order to keep Abram safe because they weren't supposed to be married. Well, actually, it was a little bit true because it, she was his half-sister, but she also was his wife. They told the truth, but only half a truth, which is really what? It's really a lie. Anything that's not the truth is a lie. And the lie was discovered, and Abraham was forced to leave the country. Now, Sarah and perhaps Abraham grew tired of waiting on God. They wanted a child, and they kept getting older and older, and still no child. So here's what Abraham does. <clears throat> he fathered a son, the son named Ishmael, but it wasn't by his wife. It was by Hagar, who was Sarah's maid, housemaid. And finally, when Abraham was 100 years old, his wife Sarah finally had their own baby, him and his wife. Now, 
Could you imagine now the conflict that erupted between Sarah and her maid Hagar over the children? Hagar and Ishmael, which was her son, were dismissed from the family. They were kicked out. And it distressed Abraham because that was his son that got kicked out. But later, God asked Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, his, his son, with his wife. And he was willing to do that. At least, at last, Abraham watched his beloved wife Sarah pass away. Boy, that sounds like God might not have been watching over Abraham. But he really was every step of the way. Through every problem, God proved faithful and he kept Abraham safe. He never let him go, not even for a moment. Think about it. He delivered him from Pharaoh, who was the ruler of Egypt. Just little Abraham got delivered from the ruler of Egypt. He was victorious in a battle with four kings from the east. God brought Abraham through a crisis with the Philistine king, another king. Abraham became the wealthiest man in the land and God blessed him with a son in his old age and made him a great nation. So God doesn't call us to a life of luxury and easiness, right? He calls us to what? Separation and security in a trouble-filled world. And as you take the journey of faith, the same God, the God of Abraham, He's watching over you. Now, God doesn't promise that the journey will be easy, right? Or that it's even going to be a hot time, a great time, a pleasant time. But he does promise this. I'm going to be with you every step of the way, he said. That's pretty good, I think. I think I'd rather have him with me than try to have a good time on my own and go through life's dangers and troubles, amen? Now, as we get ready to close today, I want to return briefly to our first point, and that's listening to God's call. I believe that right now, at this very moment, God is trying to get through to some of us, right? Whoever's listening out here on the internet, he might be trying to get through to one of you. But until you're ready to sit back and hear what he has to say, you're not going to be able to begin that journey of faith that God has in mind for you. We're getting ready to pray this morning, and I want to ask you today to open your heart and your mind to hear what God has to say. He, he wants you to make a commitment to Him. Yes, He does. He's calling you to salvation, right? He, he's calling you to maybe church membership. He's calling you to re-energize your faith in Him. He's calling you to servanthood by volunteering the spiritual gifts He's already given you to serve, to serve Him. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank You, Lord, that You have provided us with everything that we need. Help us to open our ears open our minds, open our hearts to your call. Help us to have that trust and faith in you that no matter what it is that you call us to do, that we can be assured it's the right path to take, that we don't have to worry about it. Unlike trying to do things on our own path in life, and we stumble and fall and get in trouble, your path, we know, still might have some ups and downs, but we don't have to worry about our security and safety because you will watch over us and protect us every step of the way. Lord, we know there are many of us who are listening right now who have heard the call but have not answered your call and have not done what you've already equipped them to do. And we know that if they do that now, that they open up their hearts and start doing what you ask them to, that it could make a difference of everlasting life and everlasting death, maybe just for one person that they are to minister to. That's a life that could be saved just by listening to your call. Help us to be obedient to your call now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
But we thank you all for listening and hope you'll tune in next week. Amen.